Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A, coming to you from the Holy Land Rabbi, the man, Tovia Singer. The man, the myth, the legend. Welcome back. <laughs> there we are. There we are. Yes, you look good. You sound good. Ah, so good to be back. Yeah. We, we've all missed you dearly, and we're glad you are back here with us again. Thank you for joining us. Hello. As you should miss me, and it's great to be back at the Shavuot. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Awesome. Awesome. Wow, we've had a lot of uh, struggles, but we're making it through, no doubt about it. Yeah. Oh, so right. apparently, talk. yeah, I was going to say. You and me, we need to have a talk. Okay. What's going on? All right. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have no idea. Okay. For those of you who are... Uh, who are standing up, you probably want to sit down. Okay. Here in Jerusalem, a mass of missionaries comes to the Holy Land. And not just anywhere in the Holy Land, but they gather at the southern wall, the southern steps of the Temple Mount. I'm not kidding. Explain what it, that means geographically. Oh, yeah. You want me to explain what? Yeah, just kind of geographically laid out for us. I've never been there. Sure, I've only seen sure. a picture Let of the wall. Let me just distance, lay so. this all out for you. So imagine you're staring at the Western Wall. So the Western Wall has that name because it's, after all, the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. Okay. So the if you looked over the Temple Mount, if your perspective is standing by the Western Wall, you'd have to step back a little bit, but if you walk back, the other side is the eastern wall, and then the Mount of Olives is famously there. To the right, if you're facing the western wall, you're going south. If you go left, you're going north. It's the largest man-made okay. plaza in the world. It's just enormous, okay? okay. So the so, what, just so you understand the staggering size of it, what you see in films and photographs of the Western Wall is really 10% of what really is the Western Wall. I think you're seeing like 180 feet, but really it's, I think it's like 1,600 feet across. It's just massive. The Southern Wall, okay, above it you have El Aqsa, and you actually have the stairs leading up to the temple mount itself. You actually have the stairs. You have the gateway entrances. People don't enter through there, but it's right there. The stairs are there. And those stairs on the southern mount, so again, if you look at the western wall, it's to the right, lead all the way down to the city of David, okay? okay. There's a huge open plaza there that's outside of the southern wall. The, the southern wall, it's all Herodian, at least the bottom part is. Pentecost 2023. you got to wrap your head around this, okay? Wow. Right. What does that even mean? Fundamentalist Christian missionaries gather in Jerusalem to launch a decade of, of evangelizing Jews. They want to convert the Jewish people to Christianity by the year 2033 in 10 years. You are asking the question, what is going on? All right. These evangelical Christians believe that Jesus was crucified in the year 33. I'm not going to get into why some Christians believe Jesus was crucified in 30 and others 33. It's not important, okay? So they feel, moreover, these fundamentalist Christian missionaries feel, like feel is not the right word, they insist, they argue that Jesus cannot make his second coming unless the Jews are first converted to Christianity. Mm. That belief wow. is predicated on a passage in Matthew 23. It's a very famous chapter. The last passage is germane, verse 39. Jesus, we are told, is addressing a Jewish audience. This is a Q source. 
And he says, I will not return unless you say, blesses he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, because Jesus is putatively speaking to a Jewish audience when he says this, the church understands this to mean that Jesus cannot make a second coming unless the Jewish people accept Jesus. They have to say, Baruch haba b'shem Hashem. Now, this is not the first time something like this happens, but let me tell you, there is the most the most brazen missionaries all landed here in the land of Israel with the intent of converting the Jews to Christianity. Now, there were missionaries all over Israel that came to the southern, it's called the Southern Excavation and the Southern Steps. Okay, so these are the Southern Steps. So if you're sitting at the Western Wall, just to repeat, if you turn right, you would pass the women's section, and then you have, you know, the Robertson Arch area, and then you turn the corner, let's say, if you stand at the Western Wall, I'll just to say about 180 feet. Depends where. Point is, you make a left turn. That's the south. And they're very important steps that are there from the temple times. I'm not going to go why it's interesting. These missionaries all decided to descend on Jerusalem and gather at the southern excavation for their program, Pentecost 2023. And they said the most aggressive missionaries were there. It was just a who's who of missionaries from all over the country. It's not just from here in Israel, Tikkun, the Aliyah, so don't ask. Whoever you could think of, they were there. But as they were from all over the world, they came in. Okay. And that was today. So I decided, I, now, just so you know, that area is it's a public area, but you have to go through the Davidson Center to get in there, which is kind of like a museum, a little thing, and you go, you're under the road. You, know, you have to go through a thing and get tickets to go there. But anybody can go there. It's, in, it's a museum. It's a state museum. Anyone can go there. So all these missionaries are there. Could you imagine these missionaries come to your shalayim to convert the Jews to Christianity calling upon evangelicals around the world to evangelize the Jews. And they use nice words like, you know, to pray for the salvation of the Jews, Yeshua. They do, they know all the boxes to check. Don't ask. It, well, there were so many people there, I didn't even know the numbers, and I, I wanted to go there and to, of course, record it, because I... I broadcast on this. I'm a journalist. I broadcast on anything and anything that has to do with missionary activity targeting the Jews for conversion. I mean, they're like holding communion there. Could you imagine they're doing communion at the southern part, outside the southern part of the Temple Mount? Could you imagine that? calling for the... Con now, they'll never say the conversion of the Jews to Christianity. If you're looking for to hear that, they they know that's a third rail. No one, Just like no one says that I'm anti-Semitic, no one talks that way. It doesn't mean anti-Semitism has come to an end. But people know that you don't say I'm an anti-Semite. That's just not acceptable. In the same way... It is not acceptable to say the words, um, the Jews should convert to Christianity. So they have to use dog whistles. They always are. And we know exactly what they're up to. Everybody knows what everyone's up to. But they're using all these euphemisms. Just like black men know when a certain term is used. No one says these crazy words that were used once on people, unless they're nuts. But everybody knows the terms that are used, and they mean that, okay? So when they say they want to bring the Jews to know about Yeshua, what they mean is they want to convert the Jews to Christianity. Okay? So everybody, you really better get this. I knew that because of my life is devoted to helping Jews in the church return back to the Jewish faith, 
So there's a line of people. You'll see the video. There's a line of people that are going in. They're paying things. When I come to the front desk, there was a very nice lady there, and she wanted to. I have a press pass. I, I paid to make it. Let me in. The guy apparently is running the place. Whatever the guy, he he knew right away not to let me in. They don't want let me in. This is a public place. And I said, all right, I'll pay like anybody else. Forget as a journalist. I'll just pay like everybody. He says, then you can't take pictures and you can't bring your camera. You have to leave your camera with us. So this is the way that missionaries took control. I'm not kidding. Took, seized control of a public space. This is not, it's not like the missionaries had rented out the Temple Mount. It's not like these missionaries had rented out what's called the Southern Excavation. They didn't rent anything out. <laughs> you know, this was open. You had whatever it is, like 30 shekels on your tree. And they're going, no, 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 you can't fill. Everybody's going in with their cameras. Everybody is. Every They're lined up. I mean, uh, now, in truth, it was, it was really everything that happens with me is Baruch Hashem. Because let me, I want to say this to you, men and women. If you are doing the right thing, if you are serving Hashem, and you do not, if you don't confront or you are not confronted by adversity, if no one's trying to stop you from what you're doing, you're probably doing the wrong thing. That's the truth. So in what I do, and you guys have been with me throughout this journey, so when you are saving Jews from the church, you have to expect the other side to oppose you. If certain groups would praise me, if Jews for Jesus would praise me, if Chosen People Ministries would praise me if these missionaries here in Israel operating all over would praise me. That means you have to repent right away. So just know that when you are in service and you're doing the right thing, there's always opposition and it's insanity. So there I am by the Davidson Center, the entrance. It's, oh, I'm a citizen. Right? There are people there on the line, but they're not Rabbi Tovi Singer. They're go, go, go. Cameras, go, go, go. Me, first, we're not letting you in. This is like, this is, no, this is not a private place, but. There were missionaries there who were watching everything. Some of them following me around, eyes all over the place when I showed up. Because, and I have to be ready for that. I have to be ready to be to be attacked in one way or another every day. It's just the way it is. So I thought to myself, whatever. I I have film of what happened there. I have filmed what happened there. I didn't need them because I know that these missionaries are going to try to stop me. And they were all around me, all around, all the big names. And they wanted to make sure I don't get in. Why? Because they thought that if I don't get in to the my capital in Yerushalayim, I'm say, if I can't, don't go in, they think that they can prevent you my viewers from seeing what goes on. That's what it's all about. What's all about is making sure that you don't know what's happening. You make sure that you don't, just like the magician is fooling his audience. Now, when you go to a magic show, there's a contract between you and the magician. And we, but the, the magician has to use a curtain. He has to use a box. He has to hide something. It has to be sleight of hand, right? He has to um, divert your attention to deflect. That's all that happened. So I knew what was going on. I knew what was happening. I knew that they didn't want me to share with you what's going on. 
but I have everything that's going on. And you wouldn't believe it. So I decide I'm not in the mood of, I don't want a confrontation. And plus Hashem is calling me. And as it turns out, I walk back around. I'm not going to mess there at a crazy time. And I go back around to the to that road that from that leads from Dung Gate to the Kotel. It's the road right overlooking the southern excavation. And I just let out and I explain everything that is going on. At a certain juncture, this Korean woman walks over to me. She's a missionary, but she knows who I am. She's with another lady holding a camera. I've got a camera filming everything. So I say to her, tell me why I should believe in Jesus. Why should I believe in Yeshua? Well, there becomes an entire, what can I tell you? It's like a sm- it's like just smoke and whistles. And she just won't tell me. She's like going, she actually apologized to me for the Holocaust. She's a Korean woman. She's not a Korean woman who lived in Germany during World War II. She's a Korean woman. I don't know if you got the memo, but the Koreans, from what I could tell, were not involved in the Holocaust. That would be like me apologizing for Genghis Khan. Like, why? This is all, these are all diversionary tactics. She apologized to me for the for the Spanish Inquisition. I, you understand what that is? A woman, this is a woman from the Far East who's a missionary. She's all over the place. And this is the game they play. The Korean missionaries in particular stand in front of synagogues and with big signs, we apologize. We apologize for the Holocaust. We apologize. The Koreans have no history of anti-Semitism. None. They have nothing to do with any of this. So what it is is just just a diversion, just like there are missionaries very active here in Israel, but they have to maintain some plausible deniability. So when you ask them, be aware of this, when you ask them about Jewish evangelism, you say, are you interested in converting Jews? You know what they'll tell you? This is how the game goes. They'll tell you, we don't believe in replacement theology. I'm not kidding. If you hear that, that's a massive red flag. We don't believe in replacement. What does it have to do with converting Jews? Moreover, all the missionaries that are committed to converting Jews to Christianity reject replacement theology. They all do. And for those who don't know what this means, replacement theology is the doctrine, which is also known as covenant theology, New Israel, call it whatever you want. That's what all the Roman Catholics believe. That's what the Orthodox Church believes in and many Protestant denominations, you know, the Presbyterians, whatever. Re- replacement theology is what the church believed all the way into the 19th century. That is, we're, as the Jews were chosen and were God's chosen people and were heirs to a blessing, but because they rejected Jesus and worse, killed him, So therefore, the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, but rather they've been placed by the church. Okay, the entire Catholic Church believes this. The Orthodox Church believes this. That's a very, those two denominations alone, that's, that's pretty huge, okay? But John Nelson Darby in the 19th century, a British theologian, a British minister, came to the United States and with a new gospel, and that is God never rejected the Jews, and the Jews are chosen. They're chosen by God. But that has nothing to do with Jewish evangelism. You understand? But that's the game. There's one other point to all these arguments, which I'm going to show you the video, and that is these evangelical Christians sell the notion that the reason why the Jews don't believe in Jesus is because of Christian anti-Semitism. That has nothing to do with the reason why Jews do not 
except the Christian Messiah. That's the least of the reason. Now, it's true that it is very striking that all of our persecutors during World War II, for example, were Christians. They were all Christian countries, all of them. Okay? There were no Buddhists involved in sending Jews to the gas chamber. They were the Germans that were in World War II were Lutherans and Roman Catholics. They were all Christians. All of them were. Okay. So they, they weren't uh, Hindus. <laughs> they weren't involved in this. Okay. So it's but that's that's not the reason why Jewish people reject the core tenets of the Christian religion. The core the reason why the core tenets of the Jewish of Christianity are rejected by the Jewish people is because the prophets of Israel oppose them. So this was really very insane, but I got to speak to many people, got to set the record straight, and as it turns out, got to make a point that needed to be made that was very, very important. So today was an amazing day. It required a lot of patience on my part. I knew that some of the missionaries there were totally brainwashed. I knew that some of the people who were in control of the um, of the southern excavation were completely misled. I understood very well from the opposition that I'm doing what Hashem wants me to do. And you know me, I was very genteel, everything was fine, but right away, no, you have to leave your cameras here, and of course, I'm not leaving my cameras with with anybody, that's never going to happen, and everyone else is going in. So I understand this, and this is an effort to convert the Jews to Christianity, to take control of the southern excavation, you, so that only missionaries can be there, and certainly we don't want you to hear what's going on, so therefore Black Rabbi Singer from going there and just filming it. And they thought they can get away with it, they will not get away with it, because this is what's really going on there. The call for evangelism, the Eucharist at the Temple Mount, it's mind-blowing. This was a very interesting day. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, that's the biggest summary I've heard about that evangelism in Israel in a long time. It's very, it's sad, but I get it. I see why they're doing it, but, or at least I used to see why they do it anyway. All right, Rabbi, we'll go to move on to this first caller, if that's quite all right. We'll take your caller sure. now. Caller, you live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hey, guys, it's the Rev. Robbins over here in North Carolina. Hope you guys are doing well. Welcome back. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, Rabbi, um, I was speaking with a uh, Christian friend of mine the other day, and uh, he knows that I have uh, chosen to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I've turned my back on the ideologies of Christianity. But he uh, he hit me with a verse that kind of shook me a little bit, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. It was Second Corinthians verse or chapter 11 verses 14 and 15 where it basically talks about that satan himself appears as an angel of light and so does his servants as uh, servants of righteousness and then it mm -hmm. says that their ends will uh, come as their uh, results of their actions but um is that like is that supposed to be like a I, I'm assuming he's talking about the uh, the Jews at that at the, in this question, but is this a um, is this like a a, a a quote for for like Christians to to use for if anyone questions uh, the Christian faith, or is that just like I, what what is the origins of this? And if you sure. just explain further, like why I should be concerned. Right. So. Rev, thank you, brother. Go ahead and hang up now. Two and three answer. You bet. Bye bye. Yes, sir. All right, yeah. Go ahead. So th this second section of Second Corinthians, and I say that because Second Corinthians was definitely authored, is not one letter. It's presented as one letter, but it's pretty certain that ten through thirteen was. It's another letter. They're stapled together. Quite a few authors there. The Second Corinthians is. A, this segment 
is addressing false apostles, people who are teaching false doctrines in Paul's view. Paul had opposition at every turn, and in all of his epistles, virtually all of his epistles, his opponents, his direct opponents, are not religious Jews like me, but rather there are fellow Christians who he insisted were teaching a false gospel. Okay, That's what he's dealing with in his second most important letter, Galatians. That's what he's dealing with in 1 Corinthians. That's what he's certainly dealing with in 2 Corinthians. Now, what Paul is saying here is that there are people who are who come and appear as though they are true apostles, true teachers, but they are not. Paul was fiercely antinomian, despised the notion that anyone should be keeping the ritual law, opposed it completely. And what he says in 2 Corinthians 11 is that, in fact, the devil himself can come as an angel of light. So even though people appear to be uh, an apostle, a true follower, they are not. Now, here's what you need to be thinking of. Is there anything remotely resembling this in Tanakh? The answer is no. Moreover, when the true Messiah comes, everybody knows it. What happens is that Christians, this is why I care about them, they read the Christian Bible first. I mean, they were introduced to these ideas first, and at some point they begin to study the Hebrew Bible, but they read the Hebrew Bible through a Christological filter. And this leads to all kinds of problems. See, when the true Messiah comes, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14 is launched. Everybody knows the truth. The knowledge of God covers the world like the water covers the sea. All the nations speak in a pure speech, besuffa brewer. There's no false apostles. There's no false teachers. They don't exist. When the true Mashiach comes, everyone will know the truth, and God will be one, his name will be one, and God will be king of the whole world, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. So the moment there's any notion this person is not the Messiah, then you know that he's, well, not the Messiah, because everyone follows him. But again, the problem Paul had was he had fierce opponents. A little point about Paul. Do you know people that have a hard time getting along with anyone? You ever met people who are just very disagreeable? I'll bet you have. That was Paul. Paul couldn't get along with the people he should have got along with really well. Like Peter con- confronted him, they had a whole falling out in Antioch. How do I know it? It's in Galatians 2, verse 11. He, G- Barnabas, who introduced him to the Jerusalem church, they couldn't get along. Cousin John Mark couldn't get Paul just had a lot of trouble getting along with people. He was just a very, it was his way. And Paul promotes himself that way, is that I am the chief apostle. I'm the one. What I get is not like the Jerusalem church. I get everything directly from Jesus Christ. And in fact, Paul here in 2 Corinthians is going to mock other apostles. And that's what's going on here. He's going to say, there. Uh, It's from me, not them. That's what's critical to Paul. Because Paul is spreading his iteration of Christianity, which is one where you don't have to keep the law. The law is, the law only is a, a shadow. It is not the essence. Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. And therefore, don't let anyone tell you about the law. When Paul says to the churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, who bewitched you, you foolish Galatians? Who is he speaking about? He's not talking about me. 
He's talking about fellow Christians who were teaching a different gospel, and Paul did not like that at all. So Paul was, it's only me, and let me tell you my credentials. I'm not just a Pharisee. I was most zealous for the law. See Philippians chapter 3. Paul was one of these guys. This is why I think that Paul was surrounded by female companions, followers, were around him all the time because they would be submissive to him, which means they would not pose any threat to his leadership. Uh, Paul just had a very hard time getting along with people. And Galatians, where he's addressing many churches in Asia Minor, begins the first two chapters is what? Is Paul explaining why his iteration of Christianity better, his level of revelation. This is what he starts off with in Galatians. Like, I've got it straight. Yeah, I visited the Jerusalem church and I met the brother of Jesus. Forget it. But I get everything directly from Jesus Christ. I'm the, I'm the person who is most zealous for the law. So everything with Paul is about Paul. And Paul wins. I mean, he really loses spiritually. And Paul destroys billions of people in history. Paul was the most important convert to Christianity for the, for the church. Paul's ideas become the orthodoxy of the church. And Paul's opponents, who now would be called Ebionites, these were Christians, but they had a different, held a different Christology. Nazarenes. We we don't none of the reason why I'm sort of cautious about naming them is that our information about these other groups uh, come to us from the church fathers, from from the pastoral, from the from the church fathers. So we don't have their writings. Don't survive. But Paul is finding with everybody all over the place. And that's what you see here, a mocking of the so-called apostles, the people in who are teaching a different theology that was not Pauline. And Paul wanted you to know that the law is done with. It is only a shadow. He And let me do one other point. Paul is not, this is what people think, is he saying that Gentiles don't have to keep the law because they only have to keep the seven Noahide laws. Not correct at all. What goes on in Acts 15 has nothing to do with what Paul says. Paul lets people eat meat that's offered to idols. The law has, it's, it's, he doesn't say you don't have to keep any spiritual ceremonial laws, speaking to non-Jews, because you only have to keep the seven Noahide laws. That's Acts 15. He's saying the law was never, the, the ceremonial law was never meant to be kept and was only there as a taskmaster master to get you into a relationship with Jesus, that they never had any value at all. That is the route that the church would take, whether the, the Catholic Church, all of them took that, that line. Paul, Paul's views become the orthodoxy, are adopted as the orthodoxy of the church, and his opponents were crushed. Thank you for your question. Very good. Great question indeed. Okay, caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hello, um, I, my name is Sarah. I'm calling from Germany. Welcome, Ta. Um, you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, my question is, um, I'm coming from a Christian family. Um, I became atheist and now I'm on my way to um, God again. My question is, how do I know it's now the real deal? Because my grandma, for example, she's only praying to the Virgin Mary because she said she saw her in a vision and she has that, when she's talking about her, she has that, she believes she has a true connection to Virgin Mary. And for example, other Christians, they believe in Jesus or even in other countries, um, other gods. Now, my question is, um, how do I now know that my belief in God is now the, the right way for me and um it's it's now the 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 real thing and how um get so let me let I me ask you a question I if i may are you in the southern yes. part of germany 
Um, I, I come from the southern part of Germany. Uh, now, now how 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 would I know that? Like, how would I guess that? Okay, so th there's a reason for that. <laughs> the reason I say that is that Roman Catholics are more plentiful in the southern part of Germany and Protestants in the northern part of Germany. Okay, like I was just in Germany yeah. speaking this week. Stay with me on the line in the northern Germany where it's all Protestants. And apparently the Virgin Mary doesn't come to Bremen. <laughs> you see, what happens is wherever somebody lives, that influences what vision they're going to have. If somebody lives in Saudi Arabia, the Virgin Mary doesn't come to them. I wonder why. Could you tell me why? I mean, think about it. Yeah, probably because they don't believe yeah. They don't believe in it. It's not part of the culture. Why does the Virgin Mary come to people in places like Portugal and Spain and Brazil, Argentina? Tell me why those places, somehow, the Virgin Mary is having pancakes with everybody. Tell me why. Why? Because, because that's what that's part, part of their of culture the is Roman Catholic, right? So that's what they have these, either they're making this up, or they're having non-veridical visions. Why in Bali, in Bali, the island, you've heard of Bali, right? Why do people in Bali and in India see the monkey god Hanuman? Why do they see? Why do they see it there? Because that's what they already believe, right? Does that make sense to you? Yes, it makes sense to me, but um, that's a question because they still have, it's part of the culture and they still think they have that true connection to those gods. And now when I'm praying to God and I don't believe in Jesus and I'm um, trying to um, fulfill the rules um, like a, um, Benoit, um, how do I know no, it's now okay. real? You tell me, my dear sister, I want you to help me. Let's navigate this together. You love Hashem. You're a daughter of God. You're creating the image of God, and you wish to perform the will of God. It's Him alone that you want to worship, right? Is that correct? Yes. Good, okay. Yeah. So let's figure it out. What do we do? Do we look at the Bible? Do you think that would be the prophets? Is that our source? What do you think? Um, probably, yes. Uh, yes. Um, why, no. why do we follow the Bible? Because that's the word of God, right? In the yeah. book of Jeremiah, he is battling false prophets everywhere. People who claim to be speaking in the name of God. Not kidding. That's the, one of the biggest issues in the book of Jeremiah is there are people who claim to be prophets of God who are not. They're false. Moreover, people are telling Jeremiah, we're dreaming about these prophets. They're coming to us in our dreams. You know what Jeremiah tells them in Jeremiah 29, verse 7, 8, and 9? You know what he tells them? You know what Jeremiah says? He was a prophet of God. He said, stop dreaming. You're causing yourself to have these visions. They're not from God. You hear that? Jeremiah tells okay, people yeah. who claim to have visions of false prophets, he tells them, you're causing yourself to have these visions. You're doing it to yourself. I mean, if people can just wait for a vision, why do we need a Bible for? Tell me. Tell me, my dear sister, why do we need a Bible? What for? Why don't we just wait for visions and prophecy, personally? Right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does make sense. Thank you. My dear, whenever somebody says, pray for the truth, don't walk, run for your life. Run. If somebody says that a certain God spoke to me, or the mother of God, the Theotokos spoke to me, run for your life. There's nothing like that in the Hebrew Bible, nothing like that. 
Now, in the pagan world, in the Catholic world, and that's all over the place. And as I show you, depending on what is part of the what religion is most dominant. So in southern Germany, you know this, it's more Catholic. In northern Germany, it's more Protestant. You know this because you're from Germany, right? Yes. I'm not t telling you this because I'm a prophet. I was walking in Germany in, and I could see the churches that were Catholic that became Protestant. So I could guess, which is most like why in Germany don't people have dreams about Hare Krishna? Because they're not exposed to it. Okay? So that's what's going on. So what you do is you, you, you ask the question, what is God's opinion? That's what it, now, if you're a Noahide, which you are, that means that Judaism is your faith. That's it. That's what Noahide means, that Judaism is your faith. And therefore, you always ask the question, if what I'm being told is that consistent with Tanakh, and it should be considered then, but if it's opposed by the Hebrew Bible, run away from it. It's not of God. Are there religions that produced spectacular spectacular experiences and visions of people. Of course there are. All religions do that. Do people quit smoking and doing drugs and alcohol in all religions? Of course they do. Do people get excited? All religions can do that. Of course they can, or else no one would join them. So all religions are pro producing these supposed visions. The true the truth must come from the Torah and no other source. That's all. If there's nothing in the Torah about the Virgin Mary, run for your life. Hashem loves you. Only have a relationship with him. Nobody in between. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your call. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you a lot. God bless you. Have a great one. Thank you. All right. Let's get back to the call list here. Let me see where we're at there. You got to get the right caller. I believe I've got you right now. Call you live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello, call are you there? Um, um, hi. Um, this is um, Ken from Texas. Uh, my question is about Daniel chapter two, verse forty-four. The Christians are claiming this is a prophecy about uh, Jesus and the Christian Church. So Daniel is saying here in the days of these kings, God will establish a new kingdom and it will crush all other kingdoms. The Christians are saying, like, at the days of these kings, at the days of the, the Roman Empire. So the new kingdom has to be established during the time of the Roman Empire. And the only change that happened during the time of the Roman Empire is the establishment of the Christian religion. So how would you uh, respond to this? Okay. Go ahead and hang up now, too, if you answer. Thank you for your call. I don't... I'll tell you the truth. I don't know why people fall for this. Daniel chapter 2... Is it the most famous chapter in Daniel? Maybe. Daniel is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. What comes into view are the is the statue made of four sections. The head, the chest, the legs, and the feet. When you see the four in Daniel, Zechariah, it's the four kingdoms. It represents Bavel, the golden, the silver is the Persian Empire, the bronze feet, that's the Greek Empire, and the legs of clay and iron, which don't adhere to each other. That's Edom, that's Rome, that's, Rome. that's the end. What happens at the very end is a stone is thrown, but not from a human hand. And because the clay and iron don't adhere to each other, this is Rome, this is Christendom, how chutzpahdik, that's, that's Christianity. Why is Christianity so divided? So, I mean, there are other religions that have, but to be so divided, where they kill each other, with the bloodiest religious war in human history was an interreligious war between Catholics and Protestants that lasted for 30 years. Where the entire, where all of the Holy Roman Empire, all of Germany was eviscerated, 
destroyed. Eight million people killed in a 30-year war that changed the way people look at religion. You think it's an accident that it is following that war that you have people like Spinoza emerging in the late 17th century? In the 18th and 19th century, Germany is producing some of the most anti-religious literature. No, that's the result of it. The schism between the East and the West in 1054, the Protestant and Catholic split in the 16th century, and I'm not a fan of Roman Catholicism at all. But at the Council of Trent, the longest council in Roman Catholic history, 16th century council, I think that lasted about 20 years, the Catholic Church made some interesting points to the, its Protestant enemies, and that is because it was an anti-Reformation council, that if you're rejecting the Pope, which is what the Protestant movement is essentially, it rejects the the Bishop of Rome. It rejects the authority, the ecumenical, the excuse me, the ecclesiastical authority of Rome. If you reject the Pope in Rome, the Bishop of Rome, you're just going to have to have a thousand. You're going to have a thousand popes of your own, and that's that came true. So this is all Christianity. That means Christianity is this religion that just doesn't adhere to each other the way iron and clay do not adhere. And please read it in context. I go back to Daniel 2, verse 41, 42, 43, right? So that's the whole meaning. When Hashem says that in finally at the end, though this will be destroyed. Edom is going to be destroyed. In fact, there's no there's no resuscitation or rebuilding Rome. Edom must be destroyed. Now, we want everyone in Edom to repent, to do tshuva. Of course, that's what we want. But then there'll be a, a, a God will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this is the, the kingdom that will endure forever, where all this war will come to an end when everyone will serve God and the Mashiach, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Daniel 7, 13 is the most quoted passage. I think it's about the most quoted passage in the Christian Bible. Christians ought to be familiar with this. So, and Nebuchadnezzar is going to set up a statue of gold because he's going to say, I'm not going anywhere. And he's going to find out in Daniel Four, that he's very much going somewhere, and that's down. That's another dream that's going to be interpreted. So the four kingdoms are the that come into view are the are the same kingdoms that are in view in Daniel seven. A lion, that's that's Babylon, that's the gold. The bear, Persia, leopard, Greece, four heads because Alexander the Great died young and four generals took over his kingdom. And then Edom, and then Rome. And then that's destroyed. And its place will be a kingdom will reign forever. And the Catholic Church, this is your idea of a of a kingdom? I'll tell you funny things. I just came back from Europe, from Germany, lecturing there. You know what these churches are in these cities in Europe, largely? They're museums, they're tourist sites, they're empty. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Many of these churches that were built in the medieval period today, people just visit them. These huge churches in England, in Italy, huge churches with flying buttresses. They're empty, they're empty, a bunch of old people lighting candles, they're gone, it's over with, it's done. The Jewish people must return. The Mashiach will come. When Mashiach comes, the whole world will know the truth. And there'll be only one king, and that's Hashem. How do I know it? Because the God of Israel tells me. How do you know? Because Zechariah says so. Vahoya Hashem l'melch ha'kol ha'aretz. Bayom ha'yuhu yi Hashem echod u'shmoi echod. In that day... 
God will be king of the whole world. What do you mean in that day? I thought God is king of the whole world. Well, if there are subjects that don't recognize God, which there are in Europe, in the Catholic world, that means he's not. Not everyone's except. But in the Messianic age, everyone will. So that's the final kingdom that will never be destroyed. And it comes up again and again in Daniel, as you see in Daniel chapter 7. So I just go, go right there. Okay? Thank you for your question. All right, all right. Very good. A lot of good questions coming in today. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Yeah, um, uh, greetings, Kodarav, and hello, William. Mm-hmm. My name is Bogdan, and I'm calling from Hebron in Baderwerdeberg in the south of Germany. Welcome back. Before I ask my question, I would l- just like to thank the Rav for all his work. You know, I began my Chuva almost a year ago now, and I found out about you from the Rav, whose lectures prompted me to do Chuva of Yaron Ruvenshi here. And Namash, your lectures and your books are a gift that keeps on giving. You know, just last night I finished Volume 1 of Let's Get Biblical for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, between us, I envy whatever mitzvah you did to have the merit to bring all this into the world. You know, it's really amazing. Berkusham. That's awesome. Thank you. Go right ahead. Right, right. Uh, anyway, question. not to waste any more time, my question is about Paul's epistles, in particular those directed at the Gentiles. Why he would try to get Am Israel to become apostles, to become apostates, we do not need to ask. He hated the law, that is clear, see Romans 3.20, Colossians 2.17. But what business would he have winning over Gentiles? The Galatians, for instance, they are a Celtic nation, came from Central Europe, hardly ever heard a single Dvar Torah. My question would in essence be, why would he even bother to convert the Gentiles in the first place, like in First Corinthians 9.21? Anyways, thank you for having me no, on. No, no, stay, stay, sweetheart. Stay with me. Don't, leif neshevek, don't run. You don't mind, William. No, go ahead. Just yes, keep this, this holy child of Hashem on. You got it. What motivated Paul? You have to just use your head. You quoted Galatians. You quoted, what motivated Paul was that people should honor him and follow him. Above Ibralis, over all other Christians of the time, right? Who was more likely to give him an audience, Jews or Gentiles? Use your head. Who is more likely to buy what he was selling? Jews who knew Tanakh or Gentiles who knew nothing? You know the answer, right? So, anyways, thank yeah. you very much for calling in. I really appreciate it. Okay, you can hang up now and finish tuning in for answer things. Uh-huh. The, the key is that Paul went interested in taking over the church and he traveled he traveled a lot now acts has a different view of where he went or when he went and how they are different but paul according to any of any of our sources which means whether it's paul's letters or the book of acts which are different in his journeys and it's different in a way that's highly predictable paul traveled a lot and Paul was claiming that he had unique revelation and authority. See Philippians chapter 3. See Galatians 1 and 2. See it all. Paul was a, a failure spiritually. He brought avoid Zorah, idolatry to the world. But the way he succeeded in acquiring followers is he knew exactly who was going to buy what he was selling. And those who would buy what he was selling were non-Jews. And therefore, he marks himself off as an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, I'll explain a little more here because there's a big piece going on why we see in Paul's letters that not only, but primarily he's speaking to non why he's speaking to non-Jews, what's going on, why is what Paul's selling so attractive to Gentiles, to non-Jews. So bear in mind that, pri- that during the period before the Common Era, the entire world was pagan, Judaism was the only monotheism, and non-Jews were not happy with this, and Judaism is a fairly popular religion. People want to uh, embrace the Jewish faith in this period. 
Paul is presenting something that they're going to want. He knew exactly how to market it. Use your brain. Think carefully. If somebody is interested in converting to Judaism and having the covenant with God in Jude, what might prevent, what might get in the way of that person converting Judaism? So you have someone who looks at Judaism favorably. I mean, you could imagine that in the Greco-Roman world, people are having a lot of trouble with many of the ideas but Judaism, that there's a personal God that you pray to and he's one God, that was very attractive. And moreover, I don't want to get complicated, but the henotheism that was common in the Greco-Roman world, henotheism literally means one God, but it's not one God as you would know. It's not monotheism. It's henotheism. It means there's a great, one great God and then there's these minor levels of God. That's what Christianity is. There's like the Father, and then there's minor God. So there is an, an a, a, it's not an impure, there is an iteration of idolatry that mimics monotheism more. It's not monotheistic, but heno, that's the Greek word one, henotheism doesn't mean one God is a monotheism, but it means there's one grand God, Zeus, and there are all kinds of Venus and all Jew. Don't ask. The whole, the whole scheme. The Mount Olympus. Okay. So think for a moment. The world of Paul. Now, to study history, you have to step out of your world and step into another world, or else you have no chance. If someone was considering converting to Judaism, what might interfere, what might slow that process down? Well, number one, circumcision, right? It's probably not an accident that the majority, the vast majority of people who today convert to Judaism are women. Is there a connection? I don't know. All right. Number two is just keeping commandments, keeping the mitzvot. A lot of people go, yeah, I, you know, I like Judaism. It's a pure religion. It's a religion of antiquity. This was very attractive to the Greco-Roman world. People knew that Alexander the Great had a favorable relationship with the Jews and came to Israel. It was just well known. The Jews were the people of antiquity, and this meant a lot to the ancient world. Judaism was not just a a licit religion in the ancient in the Greco-Roman world. It was a I'm not, I'm not finding the word. It's not a preferred religion, but it was it was more than a sanctioned religion. Jews were a privileged religion. They were they didn't have to bring sacrifices to the gods. They were completely exempt from it. If you're a Jew, you didn't have to bring the requisite offerings to Jupiter as part of a state ceremony. Jews were all, just off the hook. Jews now. So you understand, so Judaism, people knew about it. It was an important religion, very important religion in the ancient world, although our numbers, we don't know exactly what percentage of the empire was Jewish, less than 10%. What would get in the way of someone converting is circumcision and keeping the mitzvot. What does Paul do? Paul is saying, essentially, you can get the covenant, the privilege of the covenant, without having to get circumcised. In fact, don't get circumcised. I oppose it, like Galatians everything, <laughs> really. Yeah, it's crazy in Galatians 5, just crazy, read it for yourself, about circumcision. And keeping the commandments. So what Paul is offering is you get the covenant of the Jews and you don't keep the commandments. In fact, don't. It's a bad idea. And then you become children of Sarah, who are followers of Christ, rather than children of Hagar, which are the followers of the law. That sounds insane, but that's Galatians 4. Do you understand what a package he's selling? you understand why it took off? Why it was why it was a perfect package, because Paul is making the case, and he does this most clearly, explicitly, in Galatians 3. He actually presents the covenant that God made with Abraham based on faith, Genesis chapter 15, as though that's competing with the covenant that God made at Mount Sinai 430 years later. It's in the book. 
read it for yourself. He says, how could a later contract supersede an earlier contract? So what he's doing to these poor non-Jews in Asia Minor is saying, hey, boys and girls, you can get to be a Jew without circumcision and commandments, and you get all the benefits of being a Jew, and you're better than the Jews. Holy smokes, you've got your sales pitch. You've totally, that's what Paul's doing. And this is exactly what Paul's doing. This is not, I'm not interpreting anything. The book of Galatians is very easy to understand. At every stage, you could tell exactly what Paul's doing it and why he's doing it. There are other books he's written where there are certain things that people aren't, th this is very clear. There are two covenants, the covenant of faith and the covenant of Sinai, the law, and they are competing with each other. And the earlier covenant that God made with Abraham supersedes it. And you, therefore, in the body of Christ, how does Galatians 3 coming to a close end? I'll bet if I start that passage, in the body of Christ there is neither. You know the rest of it, right? The part we're going to talk about is not slave or free man, man, woman. It's Jew or Gentile. They're all one of the body of Christ, which means you get to be the covenant by believing in Jesus. You get to be a Jew. That's what's happening. So he, he fed the audience that demanded this kind of a message. And he figured out that to evangelize anyone, just become like that. And to people who are not under the law, 1 Corinthians 9, become as someone who's not under the law. I'm fine doing that. Someone's under the law, become as someone's under the law. All things to all men that by some means gain some. As what Paul's doing. So that's where he, that's, that he, and it worked for the non-Jews, and it didn't work for Jews. And that was the end of it. Now, does that mean Paul never tries to convert Jews? He does. Romans 7. There are exceptions, but that's not that's not the norm. And the book of Romans was written before Paul visited Rome. So he was writing to people he hadn't yet encountered. So there's the answer. It was a simple, a simple packaging marketing. The Gentiles were the ones who were interested in Judaism without the problem of circumcision commandments, and we get the covenant. Bring it on. That's the answer. But we are entering a time when all the world will know the truth and will serve the one Hashem, will reject all the teachings of the church and all the other religions of the world. They will speak besofa brura in a pure speech. May we be zeicha to witness that moment quickly, b'mheira be a minute quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. Very good. All right, moving on. Let's call, call you live on the air. Please tell us your name and where are you calling from? Hello. You're live on the air. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Corey. I'm calling from Springfield, Missouri. Very good. Welcome, sir. I uh, just want to say blessings to both of you. Thank you. Um, in Christianity, you know, it says that all have fallen short, you know, of the glory of God. And so, <clears throat> you know, I've left Christianity. And so, you know, I'm just trying to you know, get my worldview right, because it seems like, you know, Christianity hijacked, you know, the uh, scriptures. And so I guess my question is, does the Most High expect us to be perfect, uh, you know, at some point in our life? Is that what we're working to? If that makes any sense. We're, we're looking to have a, a beautiful relationship with God. That's what we're looking to have. Um... And and what Paul is going to f f thank you for your call. Okay, go ahead and hang up now. Tune for your answer. Thank you. Okay. Paul must explain why your car requires a fifth wheel. Paul has to explain why someone needs to believe in Jesus. Why can't you keep the Torah? Be loyal to Hashem, love Hashem, and then Hashem will in turn keep his promise. So Paul in Romans 3.23, Romans is Paul's most important epistle. 
And chapter three is very critical for Paul because in that he's explaining why there's nothing you can do to save yourself because we're all sinners. There's nothing you can do. You can't save yourself by being loyal to the commandments. That can't be. What Paul extracts and what Christianity follows and imitates is what the, what the church does is they present uh, Tanakh as a people who cannot repent, a, a God who has no mercy. Now, if a Christian is listening to me, it's going to really bother them because they think that Christianity is the most merciful religion, but there is no mercy. See, if a person makes a mistake and sins and then repents, God forgives that person, right? So... Hashem promises that if the sinner will turn away from his sinful ways and turn to me, I will forgive that person completely. And his sins will no longer be remembered against him. Ezekiel 18, verse 21, 22, 23. Is it my desire at all to punish the wicked? Is it not rather that he turn from his sinful ways that he may live? Got it? So let me, let me explain it. This I want to feature this in a number of ways, so that people can understand this. In Tanakh, sin is not a person. In Judaism, sin is not a human being. Rather, sin is an event. That event happened yesterday, and yesterday ended last night. Today is a new day. You are not the sin. You have free will. Will you make mistakes in your life? Of course. What does the prophets want you to do? What do they want you to do with one voice? They say, return to me and I'll return to you. If you repent, like look at, let me give you like really bad people in history. Like the people of Nineveh. This is like a book of Jonah. It's a whole book about these people who were, this was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, right? In northern Mesopotamia. God was set to destroy them. They sinned a lot. Jonah comes to them and tells them in 40 days the city will be overturned. They repent. They turn back. God forgives them. See Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Why is God telling us that? Because if you think you're bad, they're worse than you'll ever be, and I forgave them, I can surely forgive you. Therefore, when it's like when spouses make up after a fight, they can come they have the potential to come closer. When a person makes a mistake in a relationship, you could sit down with your husband and say, Sweetheart, I'm so sorry. Like, imagine if you had done something to hurt your wife, right? And then you, you go to your wife and you say, I, I did a terrible thing. You turn to your husband and say, I sinned against you. And I really deeply regret it. Imagine if people did that in their marriage, right? Their marriage would really look different. Like what's very likely to happen, right? They're going to be closer after that experience, if you're struggling in, in your marriage, it's because people are not saying those words. But people become closer in that. Now, if you think that a relationship between a husband and wife is an unfair characterization of our relationship with God, check Isaiah 54. The Lord is our husband. But why is the relationship between Man and God characterized both as we're children of God. Bonamatem Lashem Likecham Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1. You are children of the Lord your God, but also God's spouse. Those are really different relationships. But one you're born into, which we are, we are born, created in the image of God. We intuitively, we intuit that there is a God. That's why almost everyone in the world believes in some higher power. Right? But then we fall in love with God in a unique way, in a mature way, in a later stage in our life, the way two people, a man and a woman, encounter each other and fall in love. 
that's the newness of the relationship. And when you have a healthy relationship, then one spouse could say, I sinned against you and I deeply regret what I did. I must have really hurt you and I am so sorry. What happens next? If you follow that formula, you're going to have an amazing marriage. Well, what, what, but I messed up yesterday. You're going to be so much closer, so much closer. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if your marriage is suffering right now, it's because no one's saying those words. They're going, I'm sorry about that, but leave the but out. Okay. Why we told about Menashe, who was pretty much like pr almost the worst king of the Davidic house, right? Manasseh repents, and God forgave him. Why are we told that? Because Manasseh is worse than you will ever be. And God forgave him. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Seek the Lord when you find him. Call out to him as near. Look at the next verse. It says, if the person of iniquity will turn back from a sinful ways, I will forgive him. That's not preached in church. Why? Remember this. If God can forgive you through your repentance, why do you need Jesus? So what Paul has to advance in Romans 3 is that you're just a mess and you are damaged goods and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Why is that attractive? You know why that's attractive. Because who's your worst critic? Look in the mirror. Think Who's you? Who's your worst critic? You are. When did you make your worst decisions in your life? When your self-esteem was really down there. When you make your best decision. When your self-esteem is way up there. There's a reason why Christian testimonials go something like, I was on drugs, I was drinking alcohol, I was shooting up heroin, I was a drum for, and I found Jesus. Why? Why is it? Because that's when you're at your lowest point, you're likely to make the worst possible decisions of your life. So Paul is characterizing man as sinful, and there's nothing he could do to save himself. And if you're a Christian, you know I am not making this up. If you're a Christian, you know I'm not mischaracterizing Christian doctrines in order to portray the church in a way that's unfavorable. This, this is what's taught every Sunday in church. So Christianity is appealing to our lowest point. Christianity is affirming our low self-esteem and is saying, look at the standard. Everyone falls short of God. Oh, that means you have to be perfect. Real, I'm going to share this with you. There are commandments that you can only keep if you're a sinner. I'm not kidding. For instance, there's a mitzvah that only applies to a thief. I'm not kidding. There's a mitzvah. You know there are 613 commandments in the Torah. There's a mitzvah in the Torah, Veheshiva Gazel Gazal. A thief has to return the theft that he stole. Well, what I mean, you didn't steal anything. You can't keep that mitzvah. Should I go and rob a bank so I can return it? Silly. There are mitzvot that only apply to women. There are commandments that only apply to men. There are commandments that only apply to priests, the Levites. This is all silly. This is all a con game. But do not dismiss Christianity as a religion that is, uh, that is unsuccessful because it does address man's most woeful, woeful feature. And that, not that he's a sinner, but a low self-esteem. I feel like a bad person. Christianity just affirms this as you are. You're a sinner. There's nothing you do to save yourself. Christianity makes two fundamental mistakes here. Listen carefully. Number one, righteous people never sin. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is that once a righteous person sins, he can never be righteous again. Mortal sin number two. Christianity feeds off of these lies. Hashem wants you to come back. 
Is it my desire at all that the wicked should perish? Is it not rather that he turns from his sinful ways that he might live? What are you talking about? Romans 3 says that's impossible. And Romans 6 says that you cannot achieve salvation. You can't save yourself. We're all sin. The law can't save you. I'm not making this up. So that's what Christianity appeals to our low self-esteem. The Tanakh says, no, you can do it. You can make it. You can return to God. You're created in my image. I'll take you back. If your child said to you, if your daughter said to you, Dad, I said something to you yesterday that was wrong. I love you, Daddy. I'm so sorry. I so deeply regret what I said. I so, I, I repent of what I did. I sinned against you. Would you not forgive her? Of course you would. You would not just forgive her, you would hold her in your arms. How much more so the God of Israel. He has more mercy than you. Thank you for your question. Okay, very good. Moving on to the next color. I think we're... we got about 15 minutes left uh, on the air. Unless you've got... So, unless you have to I run. need to... Um, so, I have to that, that's okay. do something with the camera. So, gotcha. let me just do that so we can get it. Do we? All right. Do you want to stay so connected? Let's, let's just take... We don't have to take a break. We don't have to turn anything off. But the camera is... Okay, yeah. Yeah, so... So give me a moment. Okay, okay sure, okay. sure. So we're not ending the show. Uh, guys, sit tight. No, 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 let's just, let's, we're here. We're not ending the show. Okay, the you got it. I'm going to put a little ad for you while we wait. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. We are just about ready for you. Guys, if you haven't done it yet, go to outreachjudaism.org. You can find the two volume, uh, the yabba dabba doo, the two volume book set. On the screen, you'll see the CDs as well. CDs are no longer available, however, the audio files are. In fact, when you go to outreachjudaism.org, you're going to click on the free audio tab at the top. And if you'll notice, all the audio files match the titles in the books. Now, this is not an audio book. This, is, this was the very first part of, this is actually the very first part of the creation of the book. These were lectures that Rabbi had given over a period of time, and then he went back and wrote these two books based on those titles, which is quite brilliant because you're getting twice the information all on the same topics. And so if you haven't done it yet, definitely go there for sure. And so uh, Rabbi is almost back with us here. We've got just a few more minutes to get him back reconnected again. Um, so guys, usually we can have, uh, we usually have, we'll have four or five people at the end of the show that didn't get their questions answered. Uh, but it's sort of just like the, it's a roulette game, so to speak. Um, we don't know how long each question takes. Uh, some questions will take, uh, 10 minutes Some might take 30 or 40 minutes. So, uh, but we keep the colors in currently we still have two colors on and we probably only have time for one, but if we can squeeze two in, we certainly will. Uh, and also guys, if you really enjoy this, uh, the show series, please click that like button on YouTube because it helps, uh, the search algorithm them is when there's a lot more activity taking place a lot of comments in here for sure i appreciate that and sometimes guys you'll experience after a show is finished i will take the show it'll be marked private for a little while until i can get the time markers uh put into it with all the questions and stuff just a new process i'm taking so sometimes it goes faster sometimes it goes slower so we're just kind of waiting that out and see how it goes so all right so also, I believe there are roughly around 15 to 20 rooms left in Dallas for Rabbi's Convention. It's coming up through Bainenu, bainenu.com forward slash events. That's how you're going to find out if you want to register for this event. Uh, like I said, there are only about 20 rooms left, maybe 15 by now. I actually got the message last week, so there's probably much less now. So if you really want to go, you certainly want to you certainly want to get uh, connected with that soon. And so, uh, all right, here we go. I think he's trying to get us reconnected again sitting tight so anyway and also if you guys have any questions uh, somebody asked me for my email address earlier and i didn't put it on screen uh maybe because it's not on there <laughs> william at tanaktalk.com so the tanaktalk.com is spelt right just put william at forget the apostrophe that's just like a signature mark of mine spell william normal i could probably fix that now but i don't want to put you on hold while i do it so all right here we go looks like we got a, a smiling rabbi back on the screen again 
All right, okay. all right. Yes, we do. Okay, good deal. Good on the audio and just yep. Everything is that. just everything is just fine. So uh, we've got time for at least one more question, maybe two, depending on how fast this question gets answered. So here we go. All right, Rabbi has got his. You know what happened? I didn't plug my camera back in the AC. Oh. So we were running off battery. Gotcha. Well, I'm glad you caught that. Well, That's... It, the camera is smart, so it blinks and saying we're. We're running out of juice. We are back, my friends. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So if we could get both questions in, great. If not, that's okay. We're gonna, we'll finish out the show with giving you some good. We'll finish it off with this question. Okay, go you ahead. got it. Final question of the show right here. Here we go. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, Rabbi. And can I tell you, you're beautiful. You're a good-looking man, and you're smart. And I'm so blessed to be able to talk to you, and I hope, uh, I hope we both can be remembered well. You are a sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, what Thank am I? You, what mommy. am I? Job liver right. here? Huh? What no, I'm, What's on your mind? Just I'm not a sweet. I'm not a sweetheart. Let me tell you. I had to learn the hard way. I am the suffering, the epitome of the suffering servant because I know that God uses both blessings and curses uh, to teach us. If we do what is right, we should expect to be accepted. If we don't, well. He'll give us a few stripes and some healing wounds and uh, faithful from a friend and so on, and, and we can learn from him that way. Um, but here's my question. Uh, it is from the New Testament, and uh, Paul said something very intriguing to me that caused me to, well, it got me ejected from my Christian church and actually arrested uh, at one point as I tried to pursue my pastor, whose name was, interestingly, Simon Peter. Um and what I wanted to do was to show him uh, maybe an opportunity to see that Jesus was misunderstood, because in 1 Corinthians 2.8, it says, if the leaders of the time did not know, you know, had known this, they would not have crucified Jesus. And I know that spilling of man's blood is not right, so we should not have done that. We have a predicament because Caiaphas actually prophesied that... Um, he would uh, die for the nation. And because he prophesied that, if you can imagine, being a false prophet was not a good thing. But technically, Jonah was a false prophet because he said Nineveh would fall, and yet it didn't. But in the, when we worship God through the Spirit of God, then the letter of the law is not indicative of what its intention is. And Jeremiah proved that. Uh, because he literally says in 18, 7 to 10, he says, uh, if, and, and Jesus even uses this phrase, he says, uh, my time has not yet come, but for you, any time will do. And I caught that in Jeremiah, where he says, if at any time I tell a nation that I will pluck it up, uproot it, destroy it, and if that nation relents of its evil, I will stay my hand. And then he backs that up right behind it and says, and if at any time uh, a nation that I have decided to uh, build or plant does evil in my sight, then I will relent of the good that I had done for it. So it becomes a situation where what we do in accordance to this word is really indicative of how pleasing we are to God, the mitzvah. And um, but can, do you have any information on on that? Because when I see Jesus as being described as quote unquote the Word, I see him as a manifested being, a son trying to do the very best that he can uh, to follow God's law. And he said we had to follow that. We couldn't break well, outside let me, of let that. Me just, even, let me ask you uh, this question. Stay with me for a moment. Yeah. Before I, I drag, because you're saying so many things that I, I'm going to lose, so I want to, what would I use? What source would be accessible to me or I could tell you with any, uh, any confidence what Jesus might have said or thought? I, I want to be fair with you. I don't want to mischaracterize what I believe. If I a priori, believe that the Christian Bible is a reliable book, it's trustworthy, uh, then I'd be a Christian already. So I, I don't want to miscarry <laughs> and tell that. you that I know what 
if we can go back 2,000 years, oh, well, this is what you would find. It's impossible because when we're looking at the the Gospels, which is the really only source about Jesus, Paul doesn't tell us anything about, almost nothing about what Jesus said, did, nothing. So we're, we're looking through so much myth, layer upon layer, that like what would be our source for knowing what the original Jesus is. You'd have to use some sort of methodology, but those are, these are they're very subjective, you know, very similar to, and we don't really have access to that information. So I, I, I'm I not going to pretend to know something that I don't have access to, but let me, I will address some of the things you shared, and I hope you understand that, but let, let's, let's see if I can unpack. Rabbi, do you want to keep him on for this? I think we're okay, but I thank okay. you very, very much for joining us on air. Yeah, go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answers. And uh, um, of course, you're going to address the uh, the part about Jonah being a false prophet, hopefully as well. Right, right, right. Yeah, so okay. let, let's, let's unpack that all. Jonah, Jonah being a false prophet. So the, it's very interesting. So Jonah tells... Jonah tells Ninveh, so if you use a translation, so it's going to say something like overthrown, essentially like that. Now, why do they use, why do translate, I don't, I don't know which ones use what, but you typically, the end of Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, use the word, is an English word overthrown. Well, that's interesting. Why? Did so many English translators select that word? Like, why not destroyed? I mean, that those are easy words. Shomain, destroyed, utterly destroyed. Why did Jonah say something else? He said, "Vayoymar oid arboim yom in forty days, ne nepoches." What does that last word mean? Ne. It doesn't mean destroy, does it? This where is my friends, we like Hebrew. So the word there means to turn. <laughs> really? So that's why they the the King James, they all like that overturned, because Vinahapech, all my Jewish viewers are gonna be excited. You know, something is overturned, transformed. There really are many ways to say destroyed. That's not the way. So, of course, when Ninveh hears, when finally Ninveh hears from Yaina, that in 40 days, Ninveh is going to be over, overturned, the word there is nepoches, which means to turn. There are two ways to do that, isn't there? There are one way is that it will be destroyed, right? But let's think about something else you can do. And that is you can walk away from sin and turn around your destiny. So baked into Ninveh, into the message to Ninveh is there is a way out and they do it. And therefore they were overturned but not by destruction, but rather spiritually. And God forgave them and didn't destroy the city. So this is why, do you think, my brothers and sisters, when I urge you to learn Hebrew, you think I'm trying to be annoying? It's like when you urge your friends to quit smoking. You're not trying to be a nudge. You're not trying to be annoying. You might annoy someone, but you might go, honey, you're drinking a little too much, and it's not good for you, right? Well, your your husband may go, well, what a, so what, I had four martini. But you really love him. You just don't want him to die of what alcoholics die from, and they die much faster than smokers do. It's one of the worst things you can do to your body. So you can turn this around. And you know what Hashem does for the smoker? You quit smoking five years. If you do it, certainly if you do it soon enough, it's best to do that earlier. But whenever you do it, your body immediately begins to recover. And 
for most people, within five years, your body has repaired itself. It has the it, like v'nahapach ne poches has overturned your cells in your body have been repaired have repaired themselves and you now have a new body and your medical outlook in terms of what your chances of god forbid heart disease cancer stroke those are the big killers right those are the three big ones right you're it's like you never smoked your body has overturned okay so that's why the the word there is overthrown in many of the English translations. But there are ways to say destroyed. Yoyna was a tzaddik. He was a very holy man who loved Kalal Yisrael, who was scared for what how the Jews would appear if the people of Israel repented. He had a sense that God would forgive them and... The book of John just ends in such shock. It's like you just in shock. And we read that book in the synagogue on Yom Kippur. Remember what I always tell you, Kindleach. The worst examples are in Tanakh. So that you, no matter how lousy you think you are, there are people who are much lousier and God forgave them. Why? Because he's merciful. And if you don't think that way, it's because you live in the smoke, the stench of the smoke of the Christian world, which portrays God, the Father, as a righteous old man who's angry and will judge you harshly and you're just a sinner. And there's no way that you could talk to God, that God will forgive you. And that's why you need a mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Jesus Christ. I didn't invent it. And the Catholics will add in the Theotokos. We'll add in the Mary, Mary, the mother of God, and the saints. It's all about creating a intermediator between man and God. That's all idolatry. Let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. This is a theme that comes up a lot in Paul, and that is that God's whole plan with Jesus was a complete mystery. This comes up a lot. It's very Pauline. It's really, this is where the mystery religion comes from. This is Christianity is the motherload of the mystery religions. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean, a mystery religion? A mystery religion means, and this will connect well, dial well into Gnosticism, because if there is a grand mystery, which no one knows how to get out of it on their own, then what do you need to escape this horrible world? You need knowledge, gnosis. And that's what the Gnostics, that's why it's all one it's just one mess. It's like, imagine you people you throw out all your garbage into a container, and it sits in the sun rotting for a month. It's, that's what it all is. It's just one big, it's not a good place. So what happened, Paul must explain away a problem. I'm telling you something very deep now, and if you hang on to this, if you get what you're about to hear, you're going to climb to a new place. And we're going to do that together, my friends. The teachings of the church are not found in the Hebrew Bible. There's nothing like the Eucharist, which is in Paul, not just the Gospels. There's nothing like this salvation of, of the Messiah dying as a vicarious atonement for your sins as found in... Mark chapter 10, 45, and Matthew 20, verse 28, and so on. And there's nothing like this. There's no salvation plan that you must believe in the risen Christ that he died and rose for your sins. That's how Romans open. None of that. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. If there was something like that in Tanakh, I'd be in church now. And so would every religious do. We'd, we'd just follow it. I had that conversation with the Christian, a Jew who's a Christian today. 
you know, just, and he asked me, what would you need to believe? Yeah, he said, just show me John 17, 3, John 3, 16 in Tanakh, and I'm in church. That's all. It's really so simple. Okay. What's the problem for Paul? We're going deep. We're going high. Stay carefully. The problem is no one ever heard of these. These salvation programs are unknown to the Hebrew Bible. Worse, they are antithetical to the teachings of the prophets of Israel who oppose the ideas that the church promulgated. Okay, So Paul has to explain this. Like, Why doesn't anybody believe in this stuff? More importantly, not the Koreans, but the Jews. Because they were there in Eretz Israel, they speak the language of the Bible, and it's their Bible, and they met the prophets. Like, why? You understand the problem? Okay. So the way you solve it is you have to explain that this is all one big grand mystery that no one knew about. This is a secret, you see. It's a secret of this world. It's a secret that no one had access to. What are you talking about? We have, all have Isaiah 11, Isaiah 2. What do you, we have Zechariah 9. We have Zechariah 12. We have it all. That means if someone says this is a big secret that no one has access to, this mystery of salvation, it's a false religion. Because, like, who has access to it? Paul is saying he has access to the grand mystery. And he has direct revelation from Christ of the gnosis, of the knowledge to free yourself. You think I'm making it up, right? I'm not. Those of you who studied the church, studied the New Testament, know Ephesians 3. It's all over the place. There's nothing like that in Tanakh, that there's a grand mystery for salvation. Nothing. There's nothing. But you need that. You need to dial that lie in in order to explain why no one never heard of this. Right? All right. So then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 7 and 8, he says that if in fact the rulers of the epoch had known this mystery that I'm revealing to you, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. What? Never crucified the Lord of glory? What are you talking about? Paul in an, it speaks out both sides of his mouth, and he condemns the Jews for opposing Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 2, um, verse 14, 15, 16, um, right? I mean, what each, which is it? So that's the answer. The answer is that Paul has to come up with this idea of a mystery. It's the Christ Jesus, and that's why the term Christ Jesus is a Pauline term. You don't find... Others in the New Testament referring to Jesus as Christ Jesus, because it's the Christ figure that's the source of your knowledge that can unlock the grand mystery. What are you talking grand mystery? God loves everybody and wants everyone to have full access to everything. That would be a nightmare if there's only one way to save yourself and nobody knows it except if you happen to meet this guy from Tarsus who knows it. And that's the the gnosis, that that idea is had infiltrated every aspect, every religion, every idolatry of the Greco-Roman world. No, salvation belongs to all. The access to it is in the Torah, not in visions in Germany, in visions in Quebec. No, 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 no. It's in Tanakh. It's there. My friends, the time is short. The time now is for the nations of the world to turn to the God of Israel. May we see the coming of the true Mashiach and the redemption, not just of Israel, but of the world quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. Wayne. All right. Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. That was a great show. A lot of great questions. Good chat today too, as well. Thank you for all the moderators out there as usual. Andrea, Larry, the main ones out there has been out here for a long, long time. So appreciate you guys keeping everything within the walls. Rabbi, hope you have a great day. And we'll see you the same time, same Always. place next week as Shim Willing. So you should all have a wonderful week. And Shabbat Tov, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K. 
Talk.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa. <laughs>